Well, if you have your Bibles or your Bibles apps, and if you're able to stand this morning, I invite you to stand in honor of God's Word as we continue our series on exile from 1 Peter, starting in verse, or chapter 4, verses 12 through 14, and then we're going to be jumping over into chapter 5, 6 through 11. Hear the word of the Lord this morning. Dear friends, don't be surprised about the fiery trials that have come to you, that have come among you to test you. These are not strange happenings. Instead, rejoice as you share Christ's suffering. You share his suffering now so that you may also have overwhelming joy when his glory is revealed. If you are mocked because of Christ's name, you are blessed. For the spirit of glory, indeed the spirit of God, rests on you. And skipping over to chapter 5, starting in verse 6. Therefore, humble yourselves under God's power so that he may raise you up in the last day. Throw all your anxiety onto him because he cares for you. Be clear-headed. Keep alert. Your accuser, the devil, is on the prowl like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him. Stand, standing firm in the faith. Do so in the knowledge that your fellow believers are enduring the same suffering throughout the world. After you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, the one who called you into his eternal glory in Christ Jesus, will himself restore, empower, strengthen, and establish you. To him be power forever and always. Amen. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be, you may be seated. Uh, I, if you have and are taking notes this morning, uh, there is a section in your bulletin where you can take some notes. I want to encourage you to write this date down, September 30th. Go ahead and write that date down. It is, if you are... Uh, Mathematically inclined, it is the 273rd day of the year, but it's also a date that, for whatever reason, has a, a lot of significant historical significance. In 1791, on September 30th, in Vienna, Austria, the first performance of Mozart's last opera, The Magic Flute, took place. I know some of you are musically uh, inclined and like to know that piece of history, there you go, now you know. Thomas Edison's first hydroelectric power plant began operating along the Fox Apple River in Appleton, Wisconsin on September 30th, 1882. On this date, in 1888, Jack Ripper claimed his third and fourth victims. For those of you who are baseball junkies, on September 30th, 1927, Babe Ruth becomes the first player in Major League history to hit 60 home runs in a single season. A few years later, in 1935, the Hoover Dam was dedicated on September 30th. Now, of course, like any date uh, throughout the calendar year, there are, are a series of uh, famous births and deaths that take place. Uh, the most notable on September 30th is, to, uh, most notable death, I should say, on September 30th in 1955 was James Dean. Now, there are all kinds of other historical events that have taken place on September 30th, uh, but I, I want you to mark on your calendar September 30th and then put a, a little comma after that, 2015, because something significant happened here in St. Louis on September 30th, 2015. Does anybody know what that is? No. <laughs> your silence uh, tells me that you don't. That's okay. Uh, it's a day that in my house will live in infamy. On September 30th of 2015, Ikea had its grand opening <laughs> here in St. Louis. Amen. Yeah, there's a few amens. That's good for you. I, it's a store that I honestly used to enjoy immensely. I love their inexpensive but delicious cinnamon rolls. If you haven't tried one, they are heavenly. I really enjoy their Swedish, meat, meat, Swedish meatballs. 
Their meals are quality meals at an affordable price. And when you're feeding a family of five, you love places like Ikea, especially on like random Tuesday and Thursday nights when kids eat free. We frequent Ikea for its food. And I stress for its food. But unfortunately, that's not always heated in my family. You see, on September 30th of 2015, Stephanie, uh, my wife, came home with, and I count, three bookshelves, two dressers, two nightstands, one king bed, (laughs) one queen bed. I'm not done. A dining room table that had seven chairs and a seating bench, a work desk and an office storage shelf credenza type thing. And I'm sure, am I missing anything? Is that, is that about it? And, and I know, I mean, this is, I wish this was an actual picture of my mother-in-law's minivan. It is close to it, but it is not. I don't know how these Swedish engineers are able to cram as much as they humanly possibly can into as tight of a space as they can, but... It is amazing, and I know what you're thinking to yourself. Why are you making such a big deal out of assembling IKEA furniture? If you're asking that question, you have never assembled (laughs) IKEA furniture. It ruined my weekend. I mean, it seems so deceivingly simple, right, to follow a set of instructions. But that's exactly what IKEA wants you to think. It's easy. Well, by the end of the weekend, I found myself agreeing with SpongeBob. It should be there. Maybe. There it is. I'll have you all know that I built an IKEA nightstand, and it only took me 67 hours. And 10 of them were just me crying. (laughs) We joke in this moment, but it did take me about two and a half weeks to assemble all (laughs) of this furniture. It took over my house. We're still married. I love it. Uh, Interestingly enough, uh, shortly after this IKEA trip, uh, we did a marriage series uh, here. I don't know if you're aware of that. It was mainly for me. But following the instructions, I mean, how hard can it be to follow a set of instructions? And yet here we find ourselves as Peter begins to wrap up this letter to these communities in exile And he leaves them with a set of instructions. But before he gets to those instructions, Peter picks back up on this theme of suffering as believers. If you haven't been with us for the past few weeks, we've been in a series on on exile and, and what that exile means for us today as the church as we move forward. I truly believe that some of our best days are going to be ahead of us. But it's going to require that as a community of faith, we become more creative, that we become more disciplined. We're going to talk a, few more, uh, a little bit more about some of those things. But Peter is continuing to pick up on this, this theme of suffering. And, and earlier in his letter, he alluded to a possibility of suffering. But here in, in chapter 4, verses 12 through 14, he changes from something that may be possible to now something that is going to be probable and actual. But then he goes on to talk about this profound joy that we are to have in the midst of suffering. And I know that that seems quite odd to our our ears to hear. But you have to understand something, that as followers of Christ, we pattern ourselves around the life of Christ. Our text this morning, it's, it's typically reserved for the seventh Sunday in the Easter season. If you're not aware, Easter is not just a day in the church year, it is that, it's a significant day, but it's also a season for us as a community of faith. And this text is typically reserved for the seventh Sunday of Easter, and it's the Sunday right before Pentecost when we celebrate the birth of the church. But, but right before Pentecost is May 25th, and that's Ascension Day. And this is a text that is typically regarded uh, around that time. You see, Peter at the very forefront of his mind, as he was writing to these communities of faith, was the ultimate return of Christ. Peter kept that eschatological hope alive. It's why he can write such strange things like, Rejoice as you share in Christ's suffering. You share his suffering now so that when 
His glory is revealed, you will have an overwhelming joy. Even as you suffer. And I know, and again, as I've poured myself over this text for a number of weeks, it sounds strangely odd that even in the midst of suffering, we can somehow find joy. The closest thing that I can get to even understanding that is the days that my three boys came into this world, there, there was intense pain, not, not that I was enduring, but that Stephanie, my wife, was enduring. And I've talked to a number of mothers, and it, it's so profound how that pain that, that the moms endure during the birth quickly fades when they get to hold that child. That's as close as I can get to understanding what Peter is, is referring to here. As we share in this suffering, as, as we suffer because we are followers of Christ, because we are now this resident alien in this world, we suffer because our allegiance now is not to the empire. Our allegiance is to a new king, as we sang moments ago, is Lord of all. And it requires a new set of ethics a new way of making decisions, and it's going to make us strangers even to our neighbors and our co-workers. It's because of Christ that these communities of faith are suffering. It's because of their allegiance to Him. It's because they believed in the words from the Sermon on the Mount, which I believe Christ, I think Christ meant profoundly. They embodied a different ethic, and it made them strangers. And they were going to suffer for that. And so Peter says, rejoice. Even if you have to suffer for a little while now. Because as we celebrate the ascension of Christ, we know that ultimately Christ is one day going to return and make all things new. And it was that joy that Peter held on to even as he himself died a martyr's death. He believed in that ultimate hope for us as followers of Christ. That one day the suffering that we endure in this world will fade away. It will become a thing of the past. But in the wise words of N.T. Wright, as the risen Lord is recognized by the mark of the nails, so the church must be known by its suffering, temptation, repentance, and the bearing of the cross. We are a cross and resurrection people, which means that we must bear our suffering with joy. Peter believed that. He firmly believed in those words. But then he goes on to give some instructions. Writing to this, these communities of faith spread throughout Asia Minor. Humble yourselves under God's power so that he may raise you up on the last day. Throw or cast all of your anxiety on him because God cares for you. Be clear headed, keep alert. Your accuser, the devil, is on the prowl like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him. Standing firm in the faith. That's a set of instructions. About as practical as a writer in the New Testament gets for these communities of faith that he's writing to. And as they face persecution, as they face suffering because of the name of Christ, he encourages them to remain humble. And every single conviction that Peter held dear was worded here in verse 7. Cast all your anxiety or all your cares on him because ultimately at the, the bedrock of Peter's conviction was this. Christ or God cares for you. I think it's so easy for us to forget that when we go through tough times. But I think it's so central that we keep that 
in the very center of our understanding of who God is. That ultimately, God cares for you. I mean, every Sunday, we gather around the altar as the people of God, or at least the opportunity is presented to you. It's not just something that we throw together because I guess that's what we do as a people of God. It's not haphazard. It has intent behind it. And it's the fundamental conviction that no matter what you are going through, it doesn't matter whether it's personal or it's job-related or that it's something that's happening financially or that it's an unspoken need that's just between you and God. Ultimately, we believe that this matters because God cares for you. He cares about every single detail of your life. He cares about your marriage. He cares about your family. He cares about your financial situation. He cares about the stress that you are enduring at work. He cares about every little minute detail because we serve a loving and caring Father. Cast all of your anxiety, all of your worry, all of your fear, all of your stress on God because He cares for you. And I know it sounds so simple, but I think we need to be reminded that it was the Apostle Peter who wrote that. The one who denied Christ three times. The one who was ultimately reinstated by Christ on a beach on the Sea of Galilee. Peter, do you love me? I'm asking you this question because ultimately, Peter, I want you to understand that I love and care for you. So let me ask you a question this morning. I know you are going through some tough and difficult times. I know some of you are facing stressful situations. Are you giving it to the Father this morning? Do you trust that He cares for you? It's so easy for us to keep that in our head, but do you believe that in your heart? Do you firmly believe the very core of your conviction that you serve a Father who cares for you? Humble yourselves. Cast or throw all of your anxiety on the Father because He cares for you. How clear-headed are you this morning? How alert are you this morning? I get it. I was up until midnight Thursday watching the Cubs clinch the National League Division Series. I've needed my coffee. I haven't been as alert as I needed to be, but that's just a personal thing. But you see, what Peter's beginning to talk about is this enemy that is on the prowl like a predatory lion. And he's just waiting to devour those who are willing to walk away when the going got tough. I get it. It is so easy to say God is good when things are going grand. But it takes a mature, faithful follower of Christ to say God is good when you are enduring suffering. And I shared with you last Sunday, I I don't really, and I've never known suffering for my faith. I've never had to endure that, like that pastor in Israel that I met. And I hope, by the grace of God, I never have to endure that, or you, or our children. But it's so easy to say in the comfort of this sanctuary this morning, with very comfortable chairs and air conditioning, those things that we are so thankful for. I can walk out this door and I'm not really necessarily worried about somebody taking my life because I'm a follower of Christ. It is rather convenient and easy for me to say, God is good. But that joy that that pastor in Israel had on his face when he began to talk about Christ and the difference that Christ had made in his life, I think he understood a little bit better than I did about how to rejoice in the midst of suffering. And how he can say, God is good. God is so good to me. Resist him. 
standing firm in the faith. It's a series of very practical instructions. In fact, I think sometimes that as, as pastors and as preachers, we, 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 maybe not do, we may not always do a, well, a good enough job in, in relating a text to a community of faith. Well, what does this mean for me? Well, I, I think this morning it, it's rather simple. I think it's very straightforward. Humble yourselves. When you are facing a very stressful and anxious situation, give it to the Father because He ultimately cares for you. The enemy is roaming around, so, so be clear-headed. Stay alert. And when temptation comes, and, and I assure you, it will come, stand firm in the faith. Resist the enemy, for the enemy is actively at work. It's very clear. There's no gray area here for, for the Apostle Peter. So my, my question is for us this morning, how good are we at following instructions? I mean, don't get me wrong, I, I really close, I think I spent roughly 67,000 hours assembling that furniture. And even when I did get some of it done, I was amazed at how many pieces were still left over. I got really worried. Ikea instructions are so, so confusing. And they give this really funny-looking little cartoon character guy that I don't quite relate to. In fact, I wanted to punch him in the face a number of times. And I understand that, that so for some reason, males have a proclivity to not following instructions. But the Apostle Peter's instructions here are quite clear. So I want to ask you a, a series of questions this morning. How is that virtue of humility going for you? I mean, it, there, there, it's quite obvious. Peter says to the communities of faith, humble yourselves. Is that a virtue that we still appreciate today? Is that something that could be said of us as followers of Christ? I know enough to know that life is very stressful. It is chaotic. It is filled with curveballs. We're not promised the next day. And there are a number of things that cause us to be anxious, fearful, and afraid. When those moments occur, and some of you may be going through them now, are you giving it to the Father? Are you casting and throwing all of that anxiety onto the God who is very capable to handle the stressful situations? Do you believe in that core conviction that God cares for you? By the way, it's not just you. I want you to understand God cares for your children. God cares for your grandchildren. God cares for that person who's sitting next to you this morning in the sanctuary. God cares for that, that coworker at work, that stranger in Walmart. Maybe sometimes we have the opportunity to present the good news to others. Do you believe from the very bottom of your heart that God cares deeply, more than you can possibly know for you. How disciplined are you spiritually? Repeatedly throughout these, this letter to these communities of faith, Peter is reminding them to be disciplined. How disciplined are you spiritually? I mean, right now in our disciple group, I love our disciple group, we're, we're, we're reading through Scripture, and, and we're in Leviticus, and, and man, it is like just trudging through. <laughs> but you have to understand that it's, it's written to a people who were becoming the people of God, and that meant that they had to abide by a different set of codes and ethics. We call it the holiness code. That still applies to us because we serve a holy God. Some of it you do have to kind of trudge through. And anybody who tells me that Scripture is boring, I don't think they've ever read Genesis. 
In the first 50 chapters, there is some amazing stuff that happens there. But it takes discipline. It takes discipline to come here week in and week out to worship. In fact, I'm becoming more and more convinced that it's one of the most revolutionary things that as a people of God we can do. Is to set aside this time together and say, you know, worship is important. <laughs> and, and I know I shared this a couple weeks ago, but I'm still going to beat this dead horse a little bit. You don't come to church. You don't come to church. You are the church. You come week in and week out to worship the living God. Because you believe from the very bottom of your heart that God cares for you and he is worthy of your worship. You are active on Sunday mornings. God's the audience. We are active participants. Stay focused. The enemy is at work. I know this because every day I wake up and I check the news. And I see what's continuing to happen in our world. Which is why I continue to say, church, it is time that we go out into this world and we actually live like Jesus. That we love all people, regardless of whether or not we agree with them. That we become the peaceable people and that we serve all people. We do that with, dis we do that with discipline and with focus. So the question in closing is this. How good are you and I at following instructions? They're very clear. Humble yourselves. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be clear-headed. Stay alert. Keep focused. Stand firm in the faith. Resist the enemy when the temptations come. And one day, you will gather around the throne in the presence of the Heavenly Father. And all of the suffering, all of the trials, all of the aches and all of the pains will become a thing of the past. Because you will be in the presence of the Father and into a world that has been made new again. Will you stand with me this morning? He is a good father. He cares for you. The message is quite simple this morning. Follow the instructions. It can't get any plainer than that. The, the challenge for us as the people of God is to submit ourselves to those instructions. In good Wesleyan fashion, I believe that we can't do that on our own. We need the Holy Spirit actively at work in our life to be humble, to throw ourselves at the Father, to stay alert, to keep disciplined, to stand firm in the faith. I don't care how strong you think you are. You're not strong enough. Daily, you need to be saying a prayer such as this. Father, I need you. May your Holy Spirit fill me today so that I may go forth and be a faithful follower of your Son, Jesus Christ. I pray something like that every day because I continue to mess up royally and I need the Spirit's work in my life daily. But it also takes a community to hold us accountable, to encourage us, at times to discipline us, because we believe that it takes a village. It takes a church to raise a Christian too. And so we do this together, week in and week out, until God either calls us home or as we await that glorious and beautiful day until his son returns to make all things new. 
follow the instructions. And may you be faithful to the God who's proven himself faithful to you every day. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you.